Hello, I'm Raimu, and this is the Rusty Keyboard. I built it myself, not from a kit, but by my own design from individual parts. I also wrote my own firmware to drive it. This video covers how I did it. I live streamed a lot of the process. In fact, I kept all those streams and made a playlist so you can watch any point along the way. There's a link to it in the description, but that's quite a lot of video. If you're like most people, you don't want to have to watch all of that. So I made this summary video just for you. I hope you enjoy it and maybe even learn a thing or two. The Rusty Keyboard is a 36 key split mechanical keyboard with hot swappable Cherry MX switches and a full built-in RGB LED lighting. It might look familiar. That's because I was inspired by another keyboard, the Korn, designed by Fuston. I took the idea of a 3x5 plus 3 thumb key layout and customized it to fit my own hands. I designed the circuit board using KeyCAD, an open source circuit board design suite. Plastic shell, I modeled in Blender, an open source 3D modeling program. I paid a board house to manufacture the circuit board, but the plastic shell I printed out using my own 3D printer. To make things easier, the brains of each keyboard half is an off-the-shelf Adafruit KB2040 board, which uses Raspberry Pi's RP2040 microcontroller. It has just about everything I need on it, other than the actual keys, lights, and connectors between the boards. So why did I make my own keyboard? The short story is, it was a fun project that I felt I could accomplish to make something that I would use every day at home and at work that I'd feel proud of. If you want to skip the longer story and jump directly into the project, look in the description below where I have the video outline, and feel free to skip to the next section titled Phase 1 Establishing the Firmware. For the longer story, I have to go back to when I watched a video made by Adam13531, where he covered his own keyboard journey. I'll put a link to that video in the description as well. After trying out several other keyboards, he settled on the Korn Chalk Low Profile. Now at this point, I was already used to a Kinesis split keyboard. What fascinated me was the idea of not needing to move my wrists, having every key within immediate reach. Now that's a big plus if you're looking to improve your ergonomic setup, to avoid injury if you spend a lot of time on the computer like I do. It also looked like a fun challenge to learn how to type on it. In fact, I upped the challenge a bit by deciding to also learn a different layout besides the traditional QWERTY layout. So I went ahead and ordered a corn keyboard from one of the many websites out there that will build keyboards for you from available kits. When I got the corn, it exceeded all my expectations. Not only was it a fun new toy, it was fully functional once I got used to the concept of layering. What do I mean by layering? Well, because there are only 36 keys, not the usual 101, each key can mean several different things, and which one depends on what layers of the keyboard are currently active. For example, this key here is normally the letter S. However, if I hold down this key with my right thumb and press what was the letter S, it becomes the number five instead. It's kind of like having extra shift keys. It took me a while to get used to this keyboard, especially because I configured it with the Colmac layout rather than the QWERTY layout. Before this, I was used to typing around 90 to 100 words per minute. Now, I was back to learning how to type again, and I could barely do 10 words per minute at first. But the learning and the challenge was fun, and I kept at it, and after several months, I was back up to around 75 words per minute. Not bad. So the Korn keyboard was working out well for me, but I wasn't entirely happy with its firmware. I was using QMK, an open source keyboard firmware written in the C programming language. Now me, I'm a big fan of the Rust programming language, so a thought occurred to me. Wouldn't it be fun to write my own firmware in Rust? And if I'm doing that, why not go a bit further and make my own hardware as well? That was it for me. I had convinced myself to kick off this project. Now it might seem like a lot of complicated work, but I had done embedded firmware in the past and I knew the basics about electronics and soldering. I did a bunch of research about how key scanning works and I thought, hey, it doesn't sound too hard at all. I did most of the work for this project while live streaming on Twitch. For the first eight streams, the focus was on establishing the Rust firmware that would eventually drive my keyboard. Starting with the KB2040 microcontroller board, I soldered rows of header pins to it so that I could attach it to a breadboard. This made it really easy to connect other electronics to it, such as key switches. Anyway, I had to establish the firmware, and luckily for me, the embedded Rust community, and in particular, the RP-RS group, had already published some foundational crates that I was able to use immediately. I started with the RP2040 project template crate and quickly got a base firmware that would just blink the onboard LED. I found the board support package for the KB2040 and that gave me access both to the internal peripherals on the board as well as the external I.O. pins. I discovered other crates and started adding the functionality I needed. I found a USB device stack crate that made it easy to connect the controller to my computer and make my computer believe the controller was both a keyboard and a serial port. 
As a keyboard, the firmware sends key reports at frequent intervals, around 20 to 100 times per second, to let the computer know what keys are being pressed. As a serial port, the firmware sends a stream of diagnostic text messages of my choosing to the computer that I can see in a terminal window to know what's going on in the firmware. USB makes it easy to do both using a single physical cable, since it supports composite or multi-function devices. There were three main functionalities I wanted to write myself that I needed to get working early on. The first was key scanning. Basically, that means connecting the I.O. pins of the controller to actual keys and using them to detect when keys are pushed or released. Secondly, knowing I would have two separate keyboard halves connected by a cable of some sort, I needed to pick a communication protocol to use over that cable to get the two controllers to talk with each other. Thirdly, I wanted my firmware to be able to update itself without having to use the buttons on the controllers and program each separately. The key scanning work went really smoothly. Basically, this is how the scanning works. Keys and I.O. signals are arranged such that the keys are in a formation of rows and columns. Each row is connected to a controller output, and each column is connected to a controller input. These inputs are weakly pulled high. This means internally to the controller, each input is connected to 5 volts through a relatively high ohm resistor. So unless a stronger, meaning much lower resistance connection to ground or zero volts is applied to the input, it will read as high or a one value. Every 50 microseconds or so, the controller cycles through each row of keys, connecting each of them to ground one at a time. While connecting a row to the ground, each column input value is read. If any reads back as a low or zero value, it means the corresponding key is being pressed. So I quickly got the firmware to detect key presses and experimentally I determined how fast the scanning could be done before I got glitches from not letting the electrical signal changes settle between states. I thought I'd need to handle debouncing where a single key press appears as multiple key presses in a row due to the way that electric contacts slide open and closed, but I really didn't see it this early on because the key reporting back to the computer is relatively slow and the key functionality at this point was pretty basic. What I did have to deal with was the problem of ghosting, or more generally, current feedback from one key circuit to another, causing incorrect scan reports. No problem, I just applied what I found most keyboards use in this case, which is adding a diode to each key, which restricts current flow to one direction only, making current feedback impossible. That probably deserves a more in-depth explanation with examples of what happens if you don't use diodes, but that would make this video much longer, so I'll just instead encourage you to look up keyboard ghosting on the internet if you want to learn more about that. To make the keyboard controllers able to communicate with each other, I figured I'd start with something very basic and only change it to something more complicated if I ran into a reason for it. So I started with the UART, or Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter function to the controllers. For this, I only needed to connect four wires between the two controllers, the two power rails, five volts and ground, a third wire for the first controller to send a string of bits to the second controller, and a fourth wire for sending another string of bits from the second controller back to the first. At this point, I hadn't yet decided what kind of physical cable or connectors I would use on the actual keyboard. It didn't really matter with the breadboards because I could just connect them directly with wires. So the UART function made it not only simple to send a string of values between controllers, it's very similar to the serial port protocol I had already used to connect the keyboard back to the computer. So I could share a lot of the same code for both. I had the two controllers talking in no time at all. Getting the firmware to update itself was by far the most difficult part of the work at this point. The firmware for those microcontrollers is stored in a non-volatile flash memory chip. For one thing, it's tough to figure out how to erase and program sectors of memory on these chips, particularly because the firmware normally is constantly reading from the same chips while running the firmware. I had to write special parts of the code that would run from the volatile SRAM memory instead and then figure out how to access and use special ROM functions built into the microcontrollers themselves by the Raspberry Pi developers that perform the flash sector erasing and programming. Another aspect of the firmware update is how to replace the firmware while it's still running. I settle on a simple two-step approach. First, write the new firmware to a separate area of the flash. Then, for the second part, jump into SRAM mode to overwrite the running firmware with a copy of the new firmware, and then cause it to reboot automatically using a trick with the hardware watchdog to start running the new firmware. The last part of the feature was having one controller forward the new firmware to the other controller before updating itself. This work took many streams to get working, but in the end I got a reasonably reliable way to get the firmware to update itself without having to mess with any physical buttons or USB cables. Having gotten basic keyboard functionality working, I felt it was time to start turning to the hardware aspect of the project, 
that being mostly a software guy, I knew this was going to be a real challenge. Even considering my previous experience working with embedded software, I knew I'd be making mistakes and the turnaround time for hardware mistakes is a lot more time consuming and expensive. So rather than jumping straight to the final hardware design, I decided to make a highly stripped down prototype first. The prototype would only have 12 keys, not the full 36. It would have two ways to connect the keyboard halves together because I hadn't yet decided which I liked better. The TRRS audio jack and cable used by the Korn keyboard or a USB-C connector and cable recommended by others online. From Adam and others, I had already learned about KeyCAD, the open source circuit board design tool suite. I spent a few hours watching basic YouTube introduction to KeyCAD videos by Contextual Electronics, John's Basement, both of whom I highly recommend, until I felt comfortable diving in and using them on stream. I spent the next three streams, as well as some off-stream time, developing a basic schematic and circuit board for the prototype keyboard. As part of this work, I also designed the symbols and footprints of some of the components, such as the controller board socket and the LEDs I planned to use. I had a lot of fun learning how to do the board population and net routing. Before I knew it, I had finished the design and I had sent the design files off to the board house for them to fabricate the board for me. When I got the board back from the board house, I was extremely nervous that it would have some critical mistake of mine and I would have to go back and try again. However, quickly discovered that the power was not short circuited to the ground, all the connectors matched the mounting holes perfectly, and all the nets were routed correctly, except for the LEDs, which I'd find out a little bit later. I went to work soldering parts on the board off stream. The sockets for the controllers, the audio jacks, and the USB-C connectors, which proved to give me the most trouble because of how small and close together its pins are. The key sockets, diodes, and lastly, the LEDs. I only ended up soldering a couple of the LEDs on because I quickly discovered I had accidentally designed them to be soldered on backwards with the light shining down instead of up through the key caps as I wanted them to be. Throughout this process, I made small updates to the firmware, mostly increasing the key matrix size from 1x2 to 2x3, and used the firmware to test the hardware. Everything was working well, except for the LEDs shining in the wrong direction. So anyway, I was very pleased. Before moving on to the final hardware design, I spent some time designing and trying out some of the plastic parts of the keyboard with the prototype. The first piece I wanted to test was the top plate that holds the switches in place. I have my own 3D printer and I'd done some basic 3D modeling in Blender before, so I went to work designing the top plates. I soon discovered I'd forgotten most of what I knew about how to use Blender, and it was very frustrating figuring it out again, but I stuck to it and eventually completed the model, sliced it, and printed it out. First try printed fine, but it's a little tight for the keys to fit. It took some trial and error to discover I needed to calibrate the printer every time I print, as well as designing a little bit of margin for any holes printed in the plastic. After five revisions, I got a design I liked and fit the keyboard and keys really well. It was time to update the prototype keyboard design to transform it into the final design. So over the next few streams, I updated the schematic and the circuit board to add 24 keys, bringing the total up to 36. I repositioned the keys to fit my own hands, measuring with paper and pencil where my fingertips tend to rest naturally. I fixed the error with the key LEDs so they were shining in the correct direction. I dropped the audio jacks since by this point I had decided my keyboard has would be connected via USB-C. Not the actual USB-C protocol, but just reusing the wires for my own UART connection. I also added four underglow LEDs per keyboard half, which would be used to make the bottom of the keyboard glow different colors to indicate different things, such as whether caps lock is on or off. I also added mounting holes to the circuit board and top plates, and designed bottom plates that the circuit boards would sit on, with screws holding everything together. One mistake I made at this point was not considering the bottom plastic plates would need more room around the mounting holes in order to print well and have holes large enough to house the threaded nickel inserts that the screws would screw into. In the end, I had to shave off sections of the plastic wherever they bumped into the components soldered to the underside of the board, mostly just a few key sockets and LEDs. I got the final keyboard circuit board designed and the design file sent off to the board house. And while waiting for the boards to be fabricated, I turned my attention back to the firmware. I needed to do a lot of refactoring of the code. This included cleaning up the code that does the keyboard scanning and constructing key reports for the computer. And so part of this cleanup, I separated the different stages of the code and introduced some new features. First part of the code does the scanning to form raw key states. Second part performs a basic debouncing routine forming a debounced key state. The third part determines over time which keys are actually pressed and released. The fourth part introduces the hold tap functionality of the keyboard. Some keys mean one thing when briefly tapped, but something else when held down. For example, this key means T when tapped, 
but when held down, it means left shift. After interpreting hold tap keys, the fifth part of the code constructs the sequence of key press release state changes to be reported to the computer. The sixth and last part of the code walks through this sequence over time, applying the changes to the reports. When I got the final keyboard back, I was again happy to find out that it basically worked with no electrical errors. I did a lot more soldering, some of which I captured live on stream, but most of it was off stream. I updated the firmware to support the final 3x6 key matrix. The thumb keys I designed electrically in the schematic as if they are a sixth column, basically. One difference I made between the prototype and the final keyboards was I swapped the rows and columns. On the prototype keyboard, the columns were the outputs and the rows were the inputs. On the final keyboard, it was the other way around. To wrap up the keyboard, I added a few more firmware features I wanted. Now that I had 36 keys, I could use it for real, and that required me to finally implement layering on the keyboard. With layering added, I was able to type numbers, letters, symbols, and navigation keys like arrows and page up and down. I added one-shot mods, basically a way to press one key to make the next key after it include a modifier. For example, I wanted the right hand inner thumb key when pressed to make the next key mean a capital letter. I also added alternative configurations for keys that are needed to be reported differently on Windows versus Mac OS. For example, copy and paste used the control key on Windows, but on Mac OS the command key is used instead. To put the finishing touches on the keyboard, I added code to let me change the key configurations, what each key means when pressed, without having to update the entire firmware. I also programmed the LED lights in the keyboard to respond to caps lock state as well as showing different colors for keys that are pressed. The LED lights ended up requiring a lot more soldering work than I expected, but in the end I got every LED soldered and working. One thing I did at the very end of the project was measure how much current the keyboard uses when all the lights are on at full brightness. The answer is quite a lot. It drew so much current that my computer's USB hub limited the current to around 650 milliamps. I got my MacBook to source over 2 amps of current, but only for a few moments before it lowered the current back down similar to the PC. Now I certainly don't need to drive the lights at full brightness, so in the end I dropped the brightness down to where the current max is at around 350 milliamps, which is just fine. In fact, I updated the keyboard's USB descriptor to tell the computer about this max power requirement just to play nice. So that's it, how I designed and made my own keyboard. It was a great project, challenging me both on the hardware and software side, and it was neither short nor long. In the end, it was a project that let me build something all the way to completion, and I made something that I can use every day now. So overall, it was a very cool project, and I hope that you enjoyed watching and learning about it. I hope to work on more projects like this in the future, and try to live stream it, or at least produce videos showing what I did and how I did it. And again, if this project interests you and you want to see more of the detail of what I did, please check out the playlist I made of all the live streams I recorded while working on the project. And as always, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it.